It's not a matter of if, but when a crisis will rock your world. I'm Rashini Rajkumar, crisis strategist, licensed attorney, and host of The Crisis Files. My crisis squad and I are here to find solutions. Our suggestions are meant to empower you to handle your own crisis or prevent crises from happening. We do not provide legal, financial, medical, or PR advice for particular situations, but strongly recommend you seek out professionals to help your specific need. Today, I've got Crisis Squad member Dr. Cheryl Ziegler here. She's a clinical psychologist and author who reminds us to assess the whole person before we rush to judgment. This case file is a sensitive one. I call it, Could My Son Be a Killer? Dr. Z, all too many headlines about mass shootings at schools and public places. Here's the scenario. We have two concerned parents whose son has been talking about school shootings. Mom caught him watching video of school shootings dating back to Columbine. A teacher overheard him telling classmates how to build pipe bombs. He's even made threats of violence at school. Where do we ideally begin? It's a really good question, where to begin. People have to realize that this is a process and it starts really with what are the disturbing behaviors? Is there a pattern? So it doesn't necessarily mean it's different from the norm. What we know about many of these younger males that are committing mass shootings is they're loners. They have a lot of social media activity that, if you really look at, generally is around violence, being angry at people. You want to look at things like, were they bullied? Are they currently being bullied? That's another big piece. And of course, one of the things as a parent you want to think about is, are there guns in our house? Does this person, my son, have access to these guns? I say that really bluntly because I think in many cases you hear either We didn't know that they were hiding these firearms and ammunition in our house, in our garage, in the basement. Or you hear, we had just gotten these weapons. That's one of the differences in mass shootings as well as even suicide, which oftentimes in these mass shootings, it ends in a suicide. Access to guns is a really big differentiator whether the violent act will actually occur. So that's the first step. Are they having these thoughts and could I prevent them from having access? So really the parent has a role here. They have to ask themselves questions about their own household. There gets to be a point in time where I think a lot of parents feel like, well, I want to respect their privacy. I'm not checking their phones. I'm not even going into their rooms. I no longer look at the online portal to see what their grades are. Maybe if they go to a large school, you have very little communication with teachers. I think we're moving away from saying that's an excuse or that is a justification. I do think it is a parent's responsibility to really understand their children in this way. This is my analogy. Most of us don't go into having a child being a medical doctor or a nurse, but we very quickly learn signs of fever, signs of the flu, signs of maybe a respiratory condition. All of a sudden, you know about things that even just prior to having that baby, you didn't know about, but you learn them because you have to. You don't have your doctor living in your house with you to tell you, oh, this could be pneumonia, this could be the flu. You look at symptoms and most people think, well, those symptoms are more overt. You can measure for a fever. You can tell that they are having a runny nose. But I think mental health is the same way. I think if we can educate parents, there are really clear signs and symptoms. And we have a lot of research around the profile and the makeup of mass violent shooter, then we have to learn those signs and symptoms and be able to look at our own children and decide, maybe I don't know for certain, but I think there's some of these and I'm going to get professional help. Well, and in the case of these parents who've come to us really wanting help, we do have what I would call evidence that this child is at risk, helping friends or trying to instruct them in how to build pipe bombs, making threats of violence. At the very least, we need to get some sort of therapist in here to analyze this child, really make sure there are no guns in the house. Lots of things, this particular scenario, not only for these parents, but gives us an idea of how any parents could react when they're seeing these kinds of signs. Absolutely. In in our world, we would call that a risk assessment. 
if a parent maybe has some of these things, oh my gosh, are they talking to this? Remember, it's a parent, so they're going to be biased. Well, they don't really mean that. They just say that when they're angry. Well, there's this bully at school. That's what parents do. They protect their kids and they come up with these excuses. But I think if there's any of these warning signs, it's one of two things. It's either they're crying out for help and attention, which we want to be responsive to, or they really have gotten past that point and now they want to seek revenge or take out their anger and their aggression on others. And in either scenario, I do think it's a parent's responsibility to understand that these are signs and symptoms equivalent to the flu and pneumonia, and they have to do something. In this era of mass shootings and now multiple generations having grown up with these fears, we can't any longer say, I just simply didn't know. Dr. Z, very, very good analogy, really helping us visualize the reaction for a parent is as simple as what you would do when you see your child bleeding or running a fever or having a tummy ache. You step in as that parent, and then there are obvious next questions to ask. And that is the hope that I have for people listening to this today is that they're able to take that to their families, to their friends, to their neighbors, because people are feeling really hopeless right now. These two parents, their issue they brought to us really brings up several issues, both for them as well as for the world right now that's dealing with this. We've got trust issues. We've got anxiety issues. We have, well, what's the police role? Do the parents turn their kid in? And then the danger the child is to himself and to others, not only classmates, but teachers, the community at large. So let's try to tackle this. What are some solutions that we can give this particular set of parents? This is reminding me of when we started having conversations around the destigmatization of mental health. We have to look at this as well as if you see some of these signs and symptoms, one of the big ones being also violence toward animals, really concerning levels of being a loner, not having friendships, not having these social connections. This doesn't mean you are a bad parent. This doesn't mean that you did anything wrong. In these cases of these mass shooters, it's not like they come from a family of mass shooters. This isn't something that parents need to think to themselves, people will judge me. They'll think I'm a bad parent. What I really want to emphasize is that we're talking about prevention here. This isn't my child stole something or I know they crashed a car and they just ran and what do I do? Do I turn them into the police, right? That becomes a very clear upfront legal issue. Something has already happened. We're talking about my child appears to have mental illness. Where do I get help? And that wouldn't be going to juvenile detention. There are no stories that I know of that it goes that way. Going and seeking out help means maybe they do go inpatient. Maybe they see a psychiatrist as well. Maybe they get on medication and they actually start processing these things. I think there needs to be a shift of where we are now to where we need to go, which is we're here to support all of these families. We understand they're grieving. They have had a huge loss. They are typically not violent people themselves. And you have to be honest, I think, as a parent, maybe I'm not a violent person, but maybe I know that mental illness has run in my family. Don't keep that a secret. Share that with people. Get the right help. And just knowing that a parent would want to get the risk assessment and really be upfront about that, because when we have obvious and open threats, I would think that those teachers don't feel safe. They might really want to remove the child from the classroom so that he or she is not a danger to other kids. So what about the school's role in these kinds of situations? Parents are the front line, Dr. Z, but what about the school? I think the schools are getting more and more proactive and supported around seeing these early signs. I think it starts with teachers. They're the ones that have these students in their classrooms. They're the ones that can see if there's a change in their pattern of behavior or if they are not completing their work, if they seem to be daydreaming, if they are doodling violent kinds of things. The schools are getting better where it's the teacher that typically either goes to the school counselor or the administrator and I'm going to go back to parents again. What are they going to do? They're going to call the student in. And pretty much the next thing they're going to do is also call the parents in and say, we have a concern that your child may have violent thoughts. 
when we talk about teenagers, we can't not talk about the parents. And there have been prior tragic cases in which the parents have minimized this. They haven't supported it. They didn't come and pick up their child. That resulted in deaths. I think the schools are getting better and I think they're getting more comfortable. I think teachers need to be given more mental health frontline training around what to look for. So there's some obvious behavioral signs that they can assess and say, hmm, something's not right. They also would really benefit from trainings around depression, anxiety, because those two characteristics are part of the makeup of somebody who could become a mass shooter. So what I see here for solutions are really kind of tri-fold. We've got the parents that we as a community can support in being up front with their child, asking the questions when there are signs in the home, because in the home is where you would think the most things would be seen, and then get that child some sort of psychological mental help, some support when it comes to their whole person, uh, which starts really with that mental health. You have the teachers and the school personnel who, as you say, I love it, that frontline education. If you see this, here's what it could mean. Alert someone. Here's the initial words to say to the child. And then you also have the other people involved, the other children or other teachers that maybe aren't directly connected to the family and to the student, but they could become victims. When we lose someone in a community, whether it is a grocery store shooting or a school shooting, it happened in our community. It's not just on location where victims or anxiety is happening. All the rest of us are somewhat affected or even hurt by the fact this happened in our backyard. On that note of best practices for us as the public, Dr. Z. What do you recommend in how we react if this has happened in our backyard or how we deal with the headlines because we're seeing this all over the country? We are, and as a community, we are experiencing collective trauma around this. This isn't any longer something that you say, well, really, that doesn't happen that much. I know when it does, it gets a lot of news. Just like you said, we're talking about movie theaters and grocery stores and concerts and schools and places of worship. We are just at the point where anywhere that people congregate, there is that risk. I like how you mentioned the third part, which I hadn't directly talked about, which is other people, whether that's other students or that just is community members. It was after 9-11 when that term, if you see something, say something. That term became pretty synonymous with the post 9-11 reaction. If you see something, whether that's a neighbor who sees this kid out in the garage doing things, sees some unusual package deliveries, whatever it might be, say something. When it comes to teenagers, it's very unusual that they don't have that social media presence and they have to use the anonymous tip lines Here in Colorado, where I am, it's called Safe to Tell. There's a number that you can call or you can text or you can go online and you can type it in. And my guess is that probably not all, but probably many communities have something like that. And it is totally anonymous. For anyone listening who says, huh, I don't know anything about that in my community or that doesn't exist, get going on that then. Because it actually is used a ton. It's used for everything from sexual assault to thinking somebody maybe said something suicidal. It's used for many, many different reasons. It basically just says, you're safe to tell somebody and we're here to respond. That's one of the biggest takeaways for me is we all actually play a role in this. We play a role also as parents. We know that bullying behavior is quite associated with this type of deviant thoughts and sometimes actions. So we play a role in raising kind children, in raising children who are empathetic, in raising kids who see somebody who doesn't have anybody to play with or isn't talking to anybody and says, come, come play with me or I will come play with you. This is a huge systemic issue. It starts very young, right? Because in a lot of these cases, they'll say, this was always going on. Or when I was in elementary school, people were mean to me. And if people are mean to you long enough during these very vulnerable, sensitive times of brain development, you start to see the world as a scary place and other people as not people who feel comforting and trustworthy to you. We all have to think about what can you do. We all have to play a role in this. 
Absolutely. And definitely here on The Crisis Files, we are always looking for solutions and we love to put them out there. Lots of wonderful lessons from Dr. Cheryl Ziegler today. Thanks to this very special Crisis Squad member for her insider advice on this. And I hope that anyone listening today can really go to your city councils, to your state legislators, and ask for some version of safe to tell if you don't have that where you live. Today's Crisis Brief brought to you by Spoke 612 Productions. First, assess all risks. Then, share what you see and hear. And finally, identify mental health resources in your area. Your local community most likely has a free online or phone hotline. Spoke 612 Productions takes your ideas and brings them to life. Linda, Sarah, and Matt are committed to excellence and inclusivity. As a WeBank certified women-owned production company, Spoke 612 inspires awareness and delivers impact through storytelling. When you put your project in their hands, Spoke 612 draws on their own talents and experience to ensure they tell the best possible version of your story. Visit their portfolio at Spoke612.com. Thank you to my podcast co-producer, Tom Hamilton of Undertone Music. Want us to weigh in on your crisis? Email me, Rashini at RashiniGroup.com, R-O-S-H-I-N-I at RashiniGroup.com. I'm Rashini Rajkumar. Join me next time on The Crisis Files. <laughs>